Um, so when I was doing my master's, he was um, developing folding tools, and I took the information through the course uh, from him. I mean, it was very really interesting. So, um, so polar codes is an alternative way to prove that capacity achieving codes exist, but this is the first time that it can be done explicitly. So there's a construction that I will introduce you today um, that will, and we will prove it. So it will be sometimes a little hand-painted, it will gloss over the details, but I will try to give you the intuition why um, it actually works. So here's the outline. I will first talk about folder codes, their structure, um, and then how do we decode them, and the theoretical analysis, and then if time permits, I will talk about some extensions and applications. Okay. So, uh, so let's let's recall some very basic definitions. Uh, I'm sure you're very familiar with these um, basic concepts. The entropy is sort of the expected surprise of a random variable, right? Um, so you can write it as a discrete sample of discrete random variables. Um, and conditional entropy is basically x given y. Its entropy is this sum where you take the conditional distribution and it's a weighted conditional entropy that the by the probability of y. And then using these two, we define the mutual information, which is absolutely central information theory. So mutual information between x and y is how much the uncertainty about x is reduced by <coughs> y. Okay. And another way to say this same thing is uh, the total entropy minus the joint entropy. And this also shows you that the mutual information is symmetric if we look at y comma x as the same um, <laughs> quantity. So, <clears throat> well, channel capacity denoted by C is the maximum rate of reliable communication. By reliable communication, we mean that as the feed sequence, its length increases, the error probability should go to zero. There should be vanishing error probability. Um, so in the last class, I think I, you, you saw that the C, channel capacity, is the maximum mutual information between X and Y. For a given channel, P, X, Y, it's a probability map map. So you get the mutual information from the channel definition. So if you maximize the volume input distribution, you get channel capacity. And this is the maximum rate of reliable communication. Um, so one instance of a channel is the binary Eurasian channel. Well, this is very simple. There are two options. We either try zero or one, but the output has size three. The output has size is three. You get zero, one, or a question mark, in which case the bit is erased. So you transmit something like a sequence zero, one, one, and then what you get is either the exact bit, or sometimes it's a question mark. Okay, but when you see the question mark, it is certain that it's erased. You know it's either zero or one, but you don't know which one. Otherwise, you know the exact value. So, if you look at the mutual information between X and Y, in the way we have defined uh, conditional entropy, you see that when you see Y, how much the uncertainty on X is reduced, there are three options, right? If it's not erased, there is no uncertainty. In those cases, this is zero. If it is erased, it has the full uncertainty remaining. So the mutual information reduces to one minus epsilon times h of x. And then if you want to maximize this mutual information over the choice of the input distribution, you need to pick the input uniform, which is burning of the one half. Okay, that will maximize the mutual information. And then this will tell you that the capacity of binary Eurasian channel is uh, one minus epsilon. Okay, so this will be extremely important in polar codes. So capacity decreases as the Eurasian probability increases, right? For Eurasian probability one half, capacity is one half. And then the theorem will tell you that the maximum rate under which you can do reliable communication is this value, which is one minus epsilon. Okay. Well, okay, so let's put this in a very formal setting. So 
there's a discrete variable I'd like, like to transmit. So it's J, let's say it's uniform over N messages. So it is an encoder in this channel coding scenario. And after encoding it to the sequence Xn, we feed it to a memoryless channel, E Y given X. It's a problem we've been mapping. And memoryless property means that if you look at successive realizations of this channel, it's independent. There is no memory. Um, and then there's a decoder. So the channel decoding consists of an encoder um, and a decoder. You design these two. Um, and then the rate is the bits per channel use. Here is the messages over the discrete one through n index, which means you're transmitting log n bits, right? Because in the standard way, you can encode this by you know, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, etc. So you're transmitting actually log n bits, uh, and you are using the channel n times. So your rate is log n divided by n. And the probability of error here is defined as the probability that the decoder cannot output the input message. Okay, so when j hat is not equal to j, it's an error. Okay, so to scope things up, let's first look at an overview. So you haven't seen the complete proof of this, but this is going to be one of the main results of information theory, and this is basically due to uh, Shannon. So if the rate is less than the general mm -hmm. capacity, which is the maximum initial information, then this rate is achievable, meaning that the probability of error can vanish to zero. Okay, And there's actually a converse part. Uh, and the converse part says that if the rate is higher than this critical quantity, which is this capacity, then this rate is not achievable. There won't be any method that can achieve a vanishing error probability if your rate exceeds uh, this much, so this value. Okay? So this, this basically tells you that the maximum rate that you can reliably transmit bits is the channel capacity. Okay? So you, you haven't seen the complete proof of this, but this will be one of the main results. And in today's lecture, actually, you will see a concrete mechanism to do the first one. <coughs> you will see a mechanism, a complete design, explicit, <coughs> that will achieve capacity. OK, any questions up to now? OK. <coughs> so the Inuit by Erdogan, in fact, so I did my master's, and then I uh, moved to UC Berkeley to do my start my PhD. Um, I moved to UC Berkeley in 2010, and these were invented in 2009. The first paper appeared uh, in late 2009. And actually, the, in my first year, David Shea was teaching information theory at Berkeley, and in the information theory class, one of, one of the topics was polar codes. Just a couple months after its discovery, it was already textbook material. So it's actually extremely fundamental. It's a really easy, nice, elegant construction. It is the first explicit <coughs> way to achieve the capacity. It is a very nice structure for efficient encoding uh, and decoding. So it is very really good for hardware implementations for circuits. Um, so for now, we will assume that the channel is symmetric over the input so that the input distribution, which maximizes mutual information, is uniform. Okay, this is actually a mild assumption. If this is not true, if the channel is not symmetric, uh, there are ways to make it symmetric by redefining the inputs. This is not a big deal. And I think you have seen binary symmetric channel. That's one of the symmetric channels. Binary ratio channel, also symmetric. But it's easy to come up with a non-symmetric uh, error channel, right? So there are ways to deal with that. So now we will assume the channel is symmetric. Okay, so this is the most fundamental thing about polar codes. So we will define a two by two transformation. Okay? So U1, U2 is our input. These are two bits. Yeah, another way to say this is zero one values, 
a fancy way to say that if there are elements in a finite field, which is called a Galois field, but it's not important. They're just bits. Um, so we get u1 and u2, and then we pass them through this circuit, which is very simple. So u2 comes here, and it passes here directly. This stuff just means it's a connection. It's true. So the plus sign here is an addition operation over the bits. So it's actually an XOR operation. So how it's defined is A is the bits. This is my transformation, which is 1, 1, 0, 1. The first output will be U1 plus U2 modulo 2. Modulo 2 is important. And in the rest of the basic picture, we will usually drop this mod 2 operation and then assume that everything is modulo 2. Basically, the summation is an XOR. Right? And then XOR means uh, this might be very basic, but let's just do this. So if you XOR 1 and 0, you will get 1, right? If you XOR 0, 1, you get 1. If you XOR the same, you get, you get 0. If you XOR 0, you get 0. It's just usual summation, modulo 2. But in particular, if you XOR the same bit, x plus x, right? You get 0. So x cancels itself. but this will be the building block. This will be the most important building block. So how about this matrix squared? Squaring a matrix means you apply it twice in a row, so u2 times u2 is u2 squared. So if, if we apply this matrix one more time uh, to u1, u2, right? So here you will get u1 x or u2, and then u2 in the second row, right? And then how about this? So 1 plus 1, this plus this. It will give you u1 x or u2, x or u2, right? And then the second row is u2. Yeah, so thanks to this property, u2 cancels itself. And you get u1 u2. Right? Can everybody see this? Right? So this matrix is invertible, and further, it is it's self-inverse. This is really, really important. So invertible and self-inverse, right? So if you have the circuit, just repeat it, you will get U1 and U2 back. It's invertible. So do you know any other invertible 2 by 2 transforms, which are classical? How about real numbers? Two by two transforms, which are the self inverse. <coughs> identity, right? Identity is, is the best example. Identity is self inverse, but you can come up with more sophisticated examples. If you look at this one, this matrix is also self inverse over real numbers, right? Um, and this is actually a Fourier transform. It's a two by two discrete Fourier transform, which is absolutely fundamental in signal processing. So this transform, in a way, is the Fourier transform in bits. Okay, so when you apply it, it goes to somewhere, some other domain, apply it again, you will get it back. Okay, sort of like a spectral domain, if you know about Fourier transforms and spectrums. Okay? Okay, so let's go back to the radio channel. Very simple, you know, this is zero, one, and alpha is three alphabet. The probability of radiator is epsilon. From one, the probability epsilon, I go to an erasure, question mark. One minus epsilon probability, I get my bit back exactly as it is. So, there will be an extremely interesting interaction between this channel and the transform we just defined, okay? So let's look at Combining multiple radio channels in a naive way. This will not achieve capacity, but this will be important. So this will be similar to polar coding in some sense. So how about this repetition coding? There's an erasure channel. I repeat my bit several times, right? I need to repeat it two times. And then as a circuit, it means I have U1 here, U1, U1 here, right? What is the probability of erasure if I combine the two channels? 
So I can get u1 back with one eraser, right? If y is erased, I can get it from this one. If y minus it, I can get it from this one, right? So the erasure happens only if both are erased. And if we write erasure indicator fun function, it's an indi indicator, e1 is true if there's an erasure, e2 is true if there's an erasure here. e1 is erased if e1 and e2 happens. They are both erased, right? And what's the probability of that? They are independent. People assume that the channel is memorialist. So if there's an erasure, it has no effect here. In communication systems, this might not be true because sometimes the channel is stuck in a certain state. Uh, so if there's an erasure, you know, 10 seconds later, there's also an erasure. But we're assuming these are memorials. And what's this problem with E1 and E2? It's epsilon times epsilon, right? Probability is epsilon squared, which is good. It's, it's more reliable than the first channel, right? <coughs> and if I repeat this k times, repeat k times, <coughs> uh, the greater probability will be epsilon to k, right? But what is the rate? What is the rate of transmission? For just one bit, bit, I'm using this channel k times, right? So the rate is one over k, and probability of error is epsilon to the power k. Is this, is this good? It might be acceptable, but this is actually not optimal. So to derive the error probability down to zero, the rate needs to go to zero. So this is actually what Shannon realized. This is not optimal. You can drive the error rate to zero while getting the rate fixed. And it can be fixed at channel capacity, which is one minus epsilon. Okay, it doesn't go to zero. And we will see how this can be done. It will be very similar to this, the repetition coding. <coughs> so let's combine two real channels more cleverly. Okay? So if we plug in this transformation, u1 xor, u2 and u3, right, it actually does nothing to the capacity directly. Why? Because it's invertible. If I look at the mutual information between u and y, and x and y, x are these intermediate variables, it's the same because it's invertible, right? It does nothing, basically. The capacity doesn't change. From x, I can get u. From u, I can get x. But there will be something very interesting happening if you look at the bits one by one after we apply the transmission, uh, this transformation. Okay. So let's let's do that. So what we're going to look at is after applying this transformation, we will first consider decoding or finding u1, u1 only. We only care about u1 first. And this is a particular decoding strategy. I will decode them one by one, okay? This is called successive cancellation. When I, I'm done with U1, I will assume it's that value, the truth is that value, and I will go on, okay? Not necessarily optimal, but it is sequential and it's easy, okay? So E1, Y1, and Y2, the output, and let's say these are binary erasure channels, this is a binary erasure channel with probability epsilon. This is a, the same channel, different realization with parameter epsilon. <coughs> we, we know y1 and y2. We are trying to find u1. But we assume, so here we don't assume anything about u2. u2 is unknown. It can be anything. It can be 0 or 1, equal probability. OK? In a way, it's corrupting the signal. Here, it's like a noise because I don't know its value, right? So, when can I decode U1? So, let's look at the erasure events. And let's say E1 is the erasure event here, E2 is the erasure event here, okay? 
Um, so if y1 is erased, if the y1 is erased here, I only know y2. Now y2 tells me nothing about u1, right? It doesn't answer. So u1 is erased automatically. So how about the other way? So y2 erased, but y1 not erased. Okay, so I don't know this one. I know y1, which will get me the value here, right, in the upper branch. But it is corrupted by this bit, which is equal to likely to be 0 or 1. So again, u1 is also lost, because it's corrupted with something which is super entropic, right? So if y2 is raised, U1 is also raised, right? Some of the I tell you this value is one, but I add a noise variable, which is one or zero, which is called probability. This tells you nothing about the input U1. So it's completely erased. <coughs> okay, so we can summarize this as saying U1 is erased if erasure event one or erasure event two happens. Right? Either of the two erasure events will give you erasure in U1. Right? Is this clear? No. In this sense, this is a more susceptible, more weaker channel. It's a weaker channel. Any erasure, either of the two, will give you an erasure in U1. It, this sounds actually very useless, but it will be, um, it will actually be useful. Um, and what is this probability? What is the probability that E1 or E2 happens? So how do I how do I find this probability? So I just need to look at a table, right? This will be very basic. So so erasure event one. If this is one, it means the first channel is erased. Um, erasure event one is zero. And in this row, erasure event two is one, erasure event two is zero. So if they are both erased, the probability should be epsilon times epsilon because they're independent, epsilon squared, right? So if the epsilon one is not erased, the other one is erased, the probability is epsilon times one minus epsilon. Here it's symmetric. You also get epsilon times one minus epsilon. And this is the good event that none of them are erased, right? None of them is erased. So here we get one minus epsilon squared. And then this U1 channel, we call it U1 channel, is erased in this region, right? So the probability is the sum of these numbers, <laughs> two times epsilon, one minus epsilon. And then you can see that this is two epsilon minus epsilon squared. Okay, it's a function of epsilon. Um, this actually, this form, this number will be very important. Two epsilon minus epsilon squared. Well, is this better or worse than the original channel? Let's think about epsilon equals one half. If epsilon is one half, two epsilon minus epsilon squared is what? Two times this, one minus one over four, which is three quarters. This is actually a burst channel. It has higher probability of erasure. Yeah, it seems really useless. Um, but effectively, so this channel has a box. I can think this as a single channel because it only has you know, one input, U1, and we are trying to decode U1. It acts like an erasure channel with this probability two epsilon minus epsilon squared. Okay, effectively, it's a bigger erasure channel. Uh, you know, in the eyes of U one, it will be erased with this probability. Okay, so let's look at the second channel. There is one more input. Now we will do something special. Now we will assume that 
the value of u1 is known, and it is perfectly known. Okay? So actually, we're assuming that this exponential encoding idea succeeded, and we know the value of u1, the first bit. Okay? Well, if I know u1, then things are actually better, it should be better. Um, you're assuming. One is known. Okay. Um, so let's let's see what happens. So if y one is erased, but y two is not erased, can I find u two? I I know the value of u one y1 is erased, y2 is not erased. I know the value here, and this, this directly gives me u2. So things are good. I, I can find u2, which is a check, okay? How about the other way? If y2 is erased, y1 not erased. So this is done, and I know this upper value, right? Which means I know this upper branch here, right? That gives me u1 xor u2, but I, I knew the value of u1, so I can just xor it back, and then I can get u2. So this also works, okay? And if none of them are erased, you also get back u2, right? So this whole channel only failed if both of them are erased. Both of them are erased. There's no chance you're getting any information. So the summary here is u2 is erased if the erasure event here, e1, erasure event two they happen simultaneously. And what is the probability of this? Probability of e1 and e2 happening together is epsilon times epsilon. Right? Now, is this a good, better channel than the original or worse channel? Better, right? So epsilon became epsilon squared. So if I look at the value of epsilon squared, now it's one over four, right? And you might be curious why these numbers add up to what? One, right? So let's let's do a capacity calculation here. The original capacity was one minus epsilon, right? <coughs> I use the channel two times, which actually gives me two times this capacity, which is capacity one, right? The capacity of this channel is one over four, the capacity of this channel is three quarters, so they add up to the same thing. Actually, the total capacity is not changed. It is just redistributed, okay, into successive uses. So effectively, this is a box, and the box is like this because we know the value of u1. This acts like an erasure channel with erasure probability epsilon squared. Okay, a any questions about this? Okay, this, this is very important. So th this is actually the building block of polar flows, and we will just use this again and again. And then it will give you a capacity achieving Key. Okay, so what happened? The capacity uh, of W1 and W2, which are actually two synthetic channels, W1 is attracted equal to U1, W2 is attracted equal to U2, given U1. Um, the sum of the two capacities is equal to two times the original capacity. But uh, one of them is worse than the original, the other one of or the other channel is better than the original, okay? So when do we have equality? When does this lower bound is tight? So we have equality if, remember that this was binary erasure channel with erasure probability two epsilon minus epsilon squared, right? Equality if here, Epsilon minus epsilon squared, if this is equal to epsilon, 
then it means there's quality and there's the, the, the capacities don't change anymore, right? And when does this happen? So this is a polynomial equation. Second degree, it should have two roots. So epsilon equals zero satisfy this. But you can easily see epsilon equals one also satisfy this. Okay? It's just trying to say as long as the ratio probability is not zero or one, I will get a better or worse channel. Okay? Right. Okay, so let's do the, the important bit, which will be a little bit math, but just Honestly, high school probability. Um, it, it will be just probability calculation. So we will extend the size of this construction. So this is the channel we have been working with, right? So I will just copy this literally and paste it. So we will just combine these two channels and get a bigger channel. So how do we do that? So we will apply the same idea. Um, we had u1, u2, right? What was the idea? We just put our two by two transformation, which will give us u1 x or u2, and u2, right? And I'm gonna see these two things as two channels two bigger boxes, right? So I will transmit this using the first channel. Let's do it a bit more clearly. I will first transmit this from the first channel, right? Make it appear. And then the second one from here, which is absolutely the same idea where you can see in, inside this box. Right? So it has two inputs, two by two transformation, one goes through one channel, the other goes through another channel, which is an independent copy. So now I'm just taking the channel <coughs> and this bigger box, and I get two independent copies, two paths, one goes to the upper one, the other one goes to the lower one, they're independent. And then the same thing should apply, right? I should get a better channel and a worse channel. So let's see very quickly how this, uh, how does the math works here. So let's look at the first channel. Now, I have U1 and U2. Let's look at the first task of decoding U1 from all the observations, which is channel out plus Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4, Y1, Y2. Y3 and Y4. Okay, so when is this bit U1 is erased effectively? And let's keep the erasure indicators E1, E2, E3, E4. These are one if the channel is doing erasure. So when is U1 erased? So remember, I have this 2 by 2 transformation. And now I don't know anything about U2, right? U2 can be anything arbitrarily. So we should have two channel blocks to succeed with no erasure. Right? Yeah, question. Can I just clarify? U1, you put the U1 transfer and U2 as random, or you have to Okay, so we are here, in the end, we are going to transmit U1, U2, U3, U4, right? But for now, we are just interested in finding out the value of U1. And we assume we don't know anything about U2. <coughs> this is a particular decoding strategy, which is, let's consider it sequential. First U1, no other knowledge, then U2, then U3. This is a particular knowledge, but you're right that in the end we will transmit this whole bit vector operationally. Okay, 
tip for you. Okay. Um, so you want to erase. If I get any erasures from the two blocks, right? And if I look at inside that block, when do I get an erasure? I'm using the previous channel. I get an erasure if there is any erasure inside that block, right? So you want to erase if erasure event one happens or erasure two event happens, right? As a block, this is the erasure of the first top block. If this happens, the top block is erased. Or E3 or E4, which is the second block, the bottom block, right? In the end, if there is any erasure among the four channels, U1 will be erased. Because I know nothing else, U2 is unknown. And I know nothing else, basically. But if I know Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4, because these are inversible transformations, I can get back to one level, and then get back one more level, and find out U1. Okay? So let's look at the second task, decode U2 from the channel outputs Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4, and U1. Okay, now I assume I know the value of U1. Exactly. Um, now, this is again actually going to be the previous case. So if I know the value of U1, right, um, and I'm interested in finding U2, which means that I can either find the value here or the value here. Either the red value or the blue value. If I find the blue value, it will give me U2, I'm done. If I find the red value, the red bit, I know the value of U1, I can just XOR it and I will get U2 from that, right? So either is fine, either red or blue, which means I, I only need one of the blocks to be non-erased. And what is that event? So if you look at that event, it is E1 or E2, and E3 or E4. This is the event where we cannot decode U2. It's an erasure only if two blocks are erased at the same time, and inside the block, one erasure will trigger it. So you OR them and then end them together. Okay, and then the third task will be decode U2 from <coughs> Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4, and U1 and U2. Okay, but let us write it what will happen. It will be E1 and E2, or E1, E, sorry, E3, or E4. Why is this true? It is true because I know the value of U1 and U2, right? Which will give me the red and blue bits, right? When I go back and look at here, I will know the inputs of the, in, the, in both of the blocks, I will know the input of the first coordinate, right? The first input, I will know it if I know U1 and U2, which will bring us the previous case, where we have the better channel, this channel, right? Then you know the top input. Okay, is this clear? Where did you see that again? Hmm? You didn't start E3? E3. Oh, okay, you, okay, you're right. I'm sorry, I skipped that step. So, we need to have U3 and U4. You're absolutely right. And how do we plug in U3 and U4. We actually use the same method. We apply a two by two transformation, right? And then the first one goes through the first input available, and the first one is vacant. The second one goes through, <coughs> sorry, the second input of the second block, right? Okay, and U1 and U2 will give you the first inputs of each block 
and then if you're looking for the value of U3, it basically reduces the previous case. Then you know the top input. <coughs> So the math behind this is actually very simple, just uh, looking at these events. But I, I know it might seem a little bit complicated if you're seeing this for the first time. Um, so let's look at the probabilities of these events. So how are the probabilities are going to change? That, that will be actually much easier. So from the first channel, epsilon, epsilon must be greater probability. So you have two different channels, one better, one worse. The better channel was epsilon spread, and then the worse channel was two epsilon minus epsilon spread. Right? And now basically U3, U4, is reusing these channels. And it will create the same transformation. And the problem is will be epsilon squared squared. Because effectively it's using a radio channel which already had radio probability epsilon squared. And then the upper branch will be two times epsilon squared minus epsilon squared squared, right? We are applying the same functional transformation. Which is squaring and then two times minus squared. And then this branch will get squared. And then two times two epsilon minus epsilon squared minus two epsilon minus epsilon squared squared. Okay. So I'm reusing previous channels each time, creating two more channels, right? And then how does the probability get mapped? Is the same transformation. You go to squared or two times the value minus squared, and the average you see is 2 epsilon, so you sum the two, then you get 2 epsilon, which means the average is epsilon. So average capacity is preserved. <coughs> okay. Any question about this construction? <coughs> so the main take home message here is actually uh, this bit. The fact that Major probability epsilon is transformed to its square and two times the value minus squared. And then you get a process which looks like a tree. Uh, from independent copy, you would create non identical binary radio channels. Um, and we will see what will happen to these channels. So, any guesses what will happen to these channels if we continue growing our construction? That is, this whole thing will be a block. We will get an independent block. So we form in here for this here. And then I will do my 2 by 2 transformation. And I will apply the same thing. And then the same reason will apply. Everything will be you know, squared and 2 times multiply minus squared again. So any guesses what will happen eventually as we get things larger and larger? <coughs> say that the probability of U2 sort of knowing U1, of decoding U2 knowing U1 is pretty good. But in the end, there's also a probability of error on decoding U1. Yeah. So the probability of decoding U2 shouldn't sort of be like this conditional probability times the probability okay, of Okay, that, that's, that's, that's an amazing question. That's, that's very good. Yeah, we assume that everything succeeds uh, in every step. In each step, we succeed. So uh, do you agree that if Every step we succeed in decoding. If I want to decode U1, I'm done. I decode U correctly. In the second step, I decode U2 correctly. Would you agree everything's fine? Sure. Okay, so that is what is going to happen. So that you will not care about this carryover probabilities. Uh, because these probabilities will go to 1 or 0. And then you will always be able to decode these individual bits. But that's a perfect question, which I was kind of glossing over. But you, you will see why that happens. OK, any other question? 
Okay, let's go on. <coughs> well, we get this <coughs> tree-like process from epsilon. We get two children, you know, one has smaller value, one has larger value. If you look at the average, the average is going to be equal to epsilon because the capacity has to be preserved. If you look at the average here, it's going to be equal to this parent node. And then we can continue to grow this. And you can do this, you know how the construction works, right? You get independent copies, and then you do two by two transformation, you go on. Okay, so <clears throat> what happens if we go, if we travel these leaves, travel in this tree by picking a random path. So we will take a random path here. We will go up or down with equal probability. Each time we will take a random path with probability one half. And this is a way to index this tree. It's a probabilistic analysis method. Basically, we have exponentially many leaves, right? How do we analyze them? So we apply a probabilistic method where we pretend that things are, are random. But in fact, nothing is random. When we do this transformation, we get these channels. But we will pretend that we will randomly traverse, <coughs> randomly travel the street. <coughs> if you get a larger construction, larger than four by four, eight by eight, uh, so this animation shows you how are the probabilities are uh, updated as you go to higher, higher dimensional constructions. So here you start from epsilon, you know, the average here equals to this, the average here equals to the initial value. And in the end, it actually looks like most of the stuff is converging toward the end, zero or one. <coughs> they are approaching the boundary, and then in fact they cannot escape the boundary. So the boundaries are in a way sort of sticky, because if you take, if you're here, right, you cannot go beyond zero because these are probabilities. So it's over bounded by zero and it's upper bounded by one. It's bounded between zero and one. So if I somehow come here, this is the amount I can go, this is the maximum amount I can go this way, right? And so this value should also be equal because the average is preserved. So if I come closer to the boundary, it's pretty sticky. I cannot escape back. So actually, this is the intuitive reason why things are looking like they're converging toward the boundary. And what does this correspond to in terms of capacity? So you raise your probabilities going to zero or one, means you get capacity zero channels or capacity one channels, eventually. You either get a perfect channel, which is noiseless, perfect transmission, or you get a completely noisy channel. <coughs> so let's look at the sample paths. So here you're imagining that we take a random leaf with probability one half. So when you start, let's say you take the downward path, downward path, so these are all random, they equal probability. So you can think this as a random, imagine that this is a random process. Okay, where you do a random update. And in terms of the real channels, that means we get a better channel, a worse channel with equal probability, and we are random. And if I look at all of the possible outcomes, that means I'm looking over all channels. This is a probabilistic way to index the channels. But it, it will be very interesting to see what probability will tell you. Okay. <coughs> okay, so. <coughs> Let's, let's look at this equation. So let's say E sub T is a random process, which means T is a discrete time index, one, two, three, four, it's a natural number. Let's say it's IID uniform plus one minus one, it is like a noise sequence, okay? And let's say we have some value WT, and WT plus one is calculated using this formula. So what's the relation between this and the previous process? They're exactly the same. So if you look at when ET is plus one, if ET is plus one, you will get WT minus WT squared, right? You get two times WT minus WT squared. If ET is minus
minus 1, you will get minus w, which will cancel this, and then um, wt squared. Right? Which is exactly the same process. It's either squared or 2 times the w minus squared. Okay? And then the random coin flips determine which path you're taking this. Now, either this way or this way. Whether we are taking a better or worse channel. Okay? Well, this update rule should look familiar to you if you have heard about machine learning um, and optimization. So can someone tell me what does this look like, this update? It looks like I'm updating my parameters at every time step. So what is the closest thing you can imagine in your machine learning? Okay, quick show of hands. How many of you have taken or currently taking machine learning or a related class? Okay, so how do you fit models in machine learning? <clears throat> so your models have parameters. If you have neural nets, you know, millions of parameters in each neural nets. How do we update those parameters? Gradient descent, right? Exactly. The, the new parameter is the previous parameter plus the gradient, right? So it's called gradient descent. It's a method in optimization when you have a function f of x, right? You update your parameters step size here times the gradient of this function. And basically this is how most machine learning methods work, like neural network. Okay. So you're trying to find the bottom of a function, which is a called function. You take a step in the negative gradient and then hopefully find the global minimum. Right? Well, which sort of suggests, suggests that this curve is should be like a gradient, right? Is this like a gradient? Well, there are some differences. First of all, there is this coin flip, plus one, minus one. What does that mean? So if you're maximizing a function, you go towards the direction of gradient to increase it. If you're trying to minimize it, you go in the negative direction. This is something like a crazy gradient descent where it's uncertain whether it should maximize or minimize. It has like a personality disorder. So <laughs> it's going to be minus or minus one plus one. It's forgetting whether it's maximizing or minimizing. Okay. But in the end, if this converges to some fixed vector, right, wt plus one should equal to wt, in which case the gradient should be zero, right? I mean, in both cases, a critical point, whether it's a local maximum or minimum, means the gradient is zero, right? And when is the gradient is equal to zero, so can you tell me? W times one minus W should be zero, and this means W is zero or W is one, right? So if it converges, it's either zero erasure probability or one erasure probability, which means zero or one uh, capacity. So let's make this slightly more formal. Um, if this is the gradient, right, if this is my, now, derivative of f, uh, if this is w times one minus w, what's my function? the first integral, right? And you will get w squared divided by 2 minus w cubed divided by 3, right? It's a simple integration because this is w minus w squared, right? So it's actually gradient descent applied to this function, which is a third order polynomial. And then here you're seeing a plot of that function. Uh, the axis are w and f of w equals that function, w squared by 
divided by 2, minus w mu q divided by 3, right? And then you see it has a local minimum and a local maximum, which is local maximum at 1, local minimum at 0. So if you do this crazy gradient descent, it might converge to 0 or 1. Okay, if it converges, definitely it should be 0 or 1. So these are its critical points. Okay, but there's actually something else we glossed over. Question? Uh, yes, I have a question about this convergence issue actually. Yeah. So because we're sending bits individually, that's how we assumed in the beginning as you said, and could it be the case that once we s try to send one bit, the channel would converge to a perfect channel, and then in the second trial, it would converge to a uh, perfectly noisy channel? Or once the convergence is done, the channel would always perform the same Oh, OK, way. that's a good point. So actually, if so the time progress here from step t to t plus 1, it means a larger construction, right? Gradient descent in the sense of I get independent copies, and my bit vector is doubled in size. Right? So you get polarization. Polarization means you get convergence to zero or one if you double the construction size, which means you're transmitting more bits. And then you're looking at them individually. Okay? Does it make sense? Yeah, so the connection here is to, to gradient descent is a bit loose, but this is the intuition why it converges to zero or one. But there's actually one more possibility. It might not converge. I mean, gradient descent, if you try it in machine learning examples, it might not converge, right, if you don't set the step size right. And one thing it can do is going into a cycle. So yeah, it might zigzag, and it might not converge. So it's very interesting that that can also happen here in polar codes. It might not converge and it might zigzag. And it's actually extremely interesting why this happens. So first, let's see this theory that will tell you it will converge in probability, which will exclude some highly improbable outcomes where it doesn't converge. So um, this is studied in probability under the Martingale theory. So this process is a Martingale, which means that if you look at the expectation of the next state, given the current state, it is right where you are. The expectation doesn't change. And Martingale theory is extremely important in <coughs> probability, stochastic processes, operations research, and it can model things like uh, queues, networks, gambling, betting systems. And it's telling you that the expected reward in general is zero. It's a zero sum game. So you don't gain in expectation. Well, we will just see this result called the Martingale convergence result, and we will go over the details. So informally, this is saying a bounded Martingale process, which is a process like this. It's bounded because if you're talking about probabilities, it's between zero or one, and it cannot exceed this limit, right? These limits cannot be exceeded. A Martingale bounded Martingale process will converge to a limiting random variable w infinity such that in expectation this goes to zero. Okay, it will converge, which means that you will find the local minimum or maximum with probability one. Okay? And there are ways to make this 100% rigorous, which we will not do today. Any question about this? Yeah, in probability this process will converge. But I will also show you, which I find quite using, in some cases it does not converge, but these are quite improbable events. It will always converge in expectation and uh, almost surely according to strong probability measures. So let's look at this particular path. Let's look at down, up, down, up, down, up, periodically, okay? So we have this channel, epsilon. We go down in epsilon squared, right? And we will come back up to, you know, how to calculate this. Two times the value here minus this thing squared. So I will end up in a cycle if the value here is equal to the value here, right? Because the next step, the same thing will get squared. And then the same operation, I will zigzag. And it will not converge. Right, is this clear? 
Yeah, sure, that would be non convergent then. They're quite improbable, and this is one of them. And when does that happen? It happens precisely when the value here is equal to the value here, right? So you just need to set this to epsilon, and it will give you a polynomial equation, right? So set that to epsilon, which is solve this polynomial equation. It's a fourth degree polynomial, but four groups, but only one is inside zero and one interval, okay? And it turns out that this root is this value here, so square root of five divided by two minus one half, okay, which turns out to be something like 0 0.6180, blah, blah, blah. Can anybody recognize this number? Yeah, exactly. So it's actually defined as one over the golden ratio. So it's one over phi, and phi is defined as the golden ratio, uh, which is one plus square root of phi divided by two. So this is also the ratio between the iterates in the Fibonacci series. Um, and you see this in lots of different places in nature. So this is the uh, golden spiral, uh, which is a fractal. So this side is golden ratio, this side is one. And then this shorter side is one over golden ratio, which is also equal to the golden ratio minus one. Okay, so. And this equation will give you the, 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 the particular root, which is, you know, this one, one plus square root of five divided by two. So we, well, we see this a lot in a lot of places. If you just Google golden ratio in nature, in Google Images, these are the things you get. So you see this in sunflowers, like broccolis, like Donald Trump, polygons. Okay, so if you take this particular cap, it will not convert this. Okay, but then it means that if we start with a channel, with greater probability, which is one over the golden ratio, it will not convert, but it's extremely improbable. Okay. Any question about this? Well, so why do we get this? Sort of because polar codes are like fractals. They are self-similar. So in these spirals, if I zoom in like this, right? So you, you see that you get self-similarity. So however you zoom in, right, you see exactly the same pattern. And it's exactly the same reason where you're doing the same operation, right? Independent copies of channels through this transformation and then get the same bigger size independent transformation. So if it's an infinite size polar code, if you zoom in, you will see the same polar code. Okay, it's a fractal. The design is a fractal. Uh, and this is why I think these are extremely beautiful, elegant, and very fundamental information theory. Okay, <coughs> so let's get back to some concrete results. So here's a theorem. This is the theorem originally proved by Adler Arikan. Um, so if you look at the capacities of these resulting channels, uh, if you look at the i channel, I have n different channels when I do this transformation, transform, transform channel. <coughs> so the theorem says that the fraction <coughs> which looks at the number of channels whose capacities are greater than one minus delta. So the things which are here, okay, divided by n, the fraction of channels which end up in this region, small region, one to one minus delta, it will go to the initial capacity of the channel. And likewise, the number of channels here divided by n, this ratio will go to one minus the capacity of the initial channel, okay? So what does this mean? If we start with the binary Eurasia channel with Eurasia probability epsilon, um, the capacity was one minus epsilon, right? So after this transformation, we will see here the ratio of the channels here will be capacity, 
which is 1 minus epsilon here. And here it will be epsilon. The ratio will be epsilon to 1 minus epsilon. Okay, so 1 minus epsilon channels will be perfectly good, capacity 1 channels. And epsilon fraction will be completely noise three channels. Right? And okay, how do we use this scheme to get a capacity achieving method? That's actually really easy because we know how to transmit over perfect channels, right? If the channel is perfect, you just transmit your bit directly. If the channel is completely noisy, there's nothing you can do, right? If the word was like this, there, were, there would be no need for information service. But we are lucky that we live in this noisy world. world. But this transformation will take that noisy world into it will distill it into completely noisy or noiseless channels, and then you transmit directly over the noiseless one, which means set the bad inputs to zero, so that the encoder and decoder will know the values, okay, and they will just run this sequential decoding idea, okay, and this will achieve capacity, as this theorem uh, is telling you. Um, so. As you change this input capacity, <coughs> this is how this three process will look like. Here, this value is the capacity. It starts from capacity here, and I'm changing the capacity in this animation. So as the capacity increases, here they are concent concentrated over its tiny region, and this, as it moves up, you see things are moving from here to the upper side. Operationally, you have to freeze these bad channels. So once we have this construction, it's eight by eight. Um, you will look at the mutual information for every channel. If the for the if it was the irregular channel, um, you will get the epsilons, right? One minus epsilon will give you capacities, and you will sort them. You will sort these values, and you will see the worst one is U one because. The effective channel for U1 is the one which is trying to decode U1 with no information. And then the only way that's possible is no erasures at all, right? You should have no erasures on these eight channels. That's a terrible channel, extremely, extremely noisy. So it has this burst capacity. And then as you move down, because the decoder is telling you the values which are reported with that current bit, right? It gets better and better. The likelihood of recovery gets better and better. You we get close to perfect channels. And then how do we not use the bad channels? Right? It's very simple. We just set them to zero, which means they're frozen. If the encoder and decoder agrees that these frozen ones are set to zero, right? The decoder will just say, oh, it's zero, I know that. And then it will go on. Okay? And if you have no errors, he will achieve capacity. Okay, so here the rate is one half. Because I set four inputs to zero, I'm transmitting eight bits, which means I have rate one over two. <coughs> and so by freezing, we mean, we mean actually you can set it to any fixed value. You can set it to one if you like, but zero is more natural because you don't have to compute anything, but anything known will be okay. So we set these things to zero. So what will be the encoding process look like? So you can make a circuit like this, right? The hardware implemented, and then just feed data. This is your payload. The zeros are also in this. But there's actually another way to see what this mapping is linear algebraically. So the, the channel transformation was. 1, 1, 0, 1, right? This was G2. So the 4 by 4 construction is actually this matrix, where you will easily spot this pattern. OK, so this is called the Kronecker codec. So this is, this is G4, this is a 4 by 4 matrix. 
It's a Kronecker product of GT with uh, itself, which means I take this matrix and I write this inside it. So that it's self-similar. Okay, is this clear? And then you define this recursively. So you get G8, G4 Kronecker product with G4. <coughs> We'll write this for by for matrix in two. Um, oh, sorry. This is G4 connector for like a, a G2. Right? So you get an 8 by 8 matrix. You will get the size larger and larger. And <coughs> in the end, the encoding is some inputs are set to zero. Right? This G large G matrix uh, is multiplied by U. And then here you get the code word. Right? G times U will give you the code word. But some indices of U were set to zero, which actually selects a submatrix of this G, submatrix over the columns. And that gives you the encoding matrix, right? It's a tall matrix because you're making things redundant. If it's rate one half, I'm doubling the size, half of the bits are redundant. Okay? Yeah, so encoding works like this. How does the decoding work in, in general case? So, <clears throat> so we have talked about binary radio channel, right? But everything still applies the same in any other channel. Any other memoryless channel will be polarized the same way. And then, so the mathematical way to write this is from the W channel, so EC, we get three channels, one versus one better, but now, we cannot track these probabilities in closed form. Only for the erasure channel, this is the case that you can track the probabilities and capacities in closed form. It is because erasure channels are not altered during this transformation. These are like eigen vectors or eigen functions <coughs> of this transformation. Erasure channels in, erasure channels out. But if you change the channel, everything will apply similarly, but you cannot track it, so you have to use this formulas to calculate probability densities and capacities, which is not terribly important. The same capacity conservation will hold. Um, and then here, uh, this is one information theoretical detail. How do you prove that it will achieve capacity for any channel? So there's something called, this is Gerber's domain information theory. Uh, it tells you that for any binary metamorphosis channel, uh, if the initial information is this value for some p, and this is the binary entropy function, then if you look at the difference between uh, the good channel and the bad channel, right? This is a typo, it's w minus. Okay, the difference is greater than, the difference between the good and bad is greater than this value, okay, which is the difference of two binary erasure, uh, two binary, binary entropy functions. So essentially this says, as long as the value here is not equal to this one, this is bigger than zero, okay? And when does that happen? Uh, whenever the mutual information is not one or zero, we will get strict increase or decrease. And equality is only satisfied if this is zero, where we have p equal to p, p times one minus p. And it only happens when p is zero or one. Zero, so zero or one half, right? Yeah, zero or one, zero one or one half. Okay. So this will tell you that rigorously uh, it will polarize any binary symmetric channel. Any question about this? So, so this is specific to the binary symmetric channel. But no, this is for any symmetric channel. Any binary input. Any binary input symmetric channel, this is true. In fact, any, it doesn't have to be binary, it could be Q-ary, by your alphabet size, but it only needs to be symmetric. And then this will be true. Because in general, the mutual information can be even more than one. Oh yeah, 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 you're right. So this concept will change, and the mean degree will change. But the intuition will be similar. So as long as they're not perfect channels, right, the difference will be Bonded away by something that involves binary entropy. You're right. This form is only for the binary case. Okay, so in general, how does this work? We say
saying because the original channels are master vector channels, which is a combined and separate operation. Um, then we split, we get sort of virtual channels, right? Um, effectively, it looks like a matrix here. And then we transmit it to the channels, the linear algorithm G times um, U naught location. And then when you split, you also split the capacity. The sum doesn't change, but if you look at the individual uh, channels, the capacity is redistributed. Uh, yeah, we're just stating what it looks like in arbitrary size construction. And the Saxon translation decoder can also work in arbitrary dimensions. It only needs to uh, look at headings one by one in a divide and conquer way. So first, we will assume the first part needs to be decoded, and the second part is noise. Um, and in the first phase, you will get estimates v1, v2, v3, v4. And then when you plug in, you will get better channels in the second half. And then you will treat them as known and then try to decode the second half. It will be exactly the same. And if you look at the first phase, in any size construction, uh, the first phase just actually consists of two channels at once. So it's never complicated. It always boils down to the two by two case when you're trying to decode. So you decode V1 under the assumption that this is noise. And when you decode it, you write that value. And then you will try to decode A1, V1, V1 in the second phase. Yeah, so this goes on like that. And for general channels, you need to track a likelihood ratio to be able to decode, which will be basically the channel transmission probability. We will see whether 0 or 1 gives you a bigger likelihood, a larger likelihood, and then we will set it to 0 or 1 according to the likelihood. But if it's frozen, you know the value exactly. Uh, if it's 0, you plug in the value 0. Okay, so it will achieve the capacity in the general sense, and then the probability of error explicitly depends on the block length in this way. So the probability of error decreases, it vanishes as fast as 2 to the minus square root of n. Okay? So you will see that in random codes, you can get a better rate than this. So there's still an open question here. It will achieve capacity, but does it achieve as fast as random codes? Okay, that is actually unknown. So is there a mechanism that will explicitly achieve capacity as fast as random codes? This is still an open problem. Um, so there is also a list decoding idea which improves the successful translation decoder, which doesn't immediately commit to a value, but it keeps track of two different alternatives or four different alternatives. It's very simple, and then it gives you a better uh, error transition. If you look at SNR versus the big error rate, if you increase the list size, you will uh, get lower and lower error, and it's going to be most likely uh, maximum likely decoder, which checks every possibility. So let me conclude by saying uh, all the codes were accepted to be in the 5G standard. So 5G will be an amazing increase in capacity, so, um, you know, Huawei used polar codes, and they demonstrated that they can use a polar coding mechanism, and they achieved 27 gigabits per second. So you can compare this with the current LTE center, which is only 5 and about megabits per second. So the rate of increase, uh, you get like 100 times higher uh, bit rate. But not only due to polar codes, it's also because of the antennas and the design changes, multiple input, multiple output communications. So when you say 100, it looks more like 1,000. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> but more practically, I mean, you're saying 100 because this is just an isolated experiment, one to one communication. Yeah. Okay, so this is a good point to stop. Any questions?